Um, everybody can hear us uh, and everybody can see us. Uh, this is not something that I, I do too regularly, so uh, I can't see a crowd, I can't see any uh, any audience, but I hear that it's about 800 people from around the world that are joining us on this GBSB Business School um, event this evening. Thank you all very much for, for coming and, and hopefully we have got a cracking one hour session uh, ready for you uh, to listen to. The title today is the role of international development for major sports leagues and clubs growth. Uh, we have got a very, very exciting panel, which I will introduce you to in just one moment. Um, I would just like to say that I've actually, sorry, I probably should introduce myself. Uh, my name is Will Lloyd. I am Chief Executive Officer of Global Sports, which is a digital media and talent platform for the global sports industry. Uh, I have worked in the sports industry for, for actually 25 years, um, which is has gone very, very quickly. Um, and when everybody has worked for 25 years, they'll probably say the same. But the concept of internationalization or globalization has been around for many years and, and many different words have been thrown around uh, and I also remember a word that was called uh, glocal, which was a sort of a combination between global and local. And everybody at one stage was shouting from the rooftops about how they were glocal. Um, but these are all sort of terms that have been used uh, through my 25 years. But some of the information and the reality of what people have achieved in that time it is absolutely astonishing, uh, and I, and I, I've looked at, uh, I've sort of done some research around the, the subjects that we're going to be talking about today. And if you look at the NBA, the NBA uh, had its first international exhibition match in 1978, I think it was in Israel. That since then they've opened. 16 different offices and still running 16 different offices around the world. Most people in the street would just go MBA, America, end of story. But they have 16 different offices running um, a, a global um, phenomenon. Um, you've got Liverpool Football Club, who, as we all know, one of the, the leading football clubs around the world, they've, they've got over 1 billion followers, um, which for a football club, just or even just Liverpool is just astonishing. Um, and then we've got La Liga, right? And I, I look at La Liga, La Liga only recently in my, in my eyes, but it was actually 2016, they started a, building a global network. Since then, in the sort of six, seven years that they've been operating, they've signed 37 agreements, 37 agreements with leagues, federations and institutions in more than 28 different countries around the world. Um, that to me uh, is, is, is amazing. And I think we all talk about it, we all think we know about it, but until you put some perspective around it, you don't realize how big and how amazing some of these um, sports organizations, whether they're a club or a league, can be. That was my little anecdote to, to start with. Um, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our panelists. Um, first of all, I, I, what I'll do is I'll just introduce you by name uh, and by uh, uh, by organisation, and then they'll introduce themselves in terms of a bit more detail and give you their background. But but first of all, uh, Steve Steve Nuss uh, is based in London, works for the NBA, uh, and thank you very much for joining us, Steve. We've got Flint Flint Riley, who works for Liverpool Football Club, uh, based in New York. Um, thank you very much for joining us, Flint. And um, we've got uh, Ayodeji, who is in Lagos, Nigeria, uh, who uh, works for La Liga. So thank you all very much for joining us. And if we, Steve, if you don't mind kicking off, uh, love to hear a little bit more about sort of your journey to your current role and, um, and what, uh, yeah, probably that, what your journey is to your current role and any sort of um, a snippet about what what that looks like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. of course. Thanks. Thanks, Will. Um, thanks, everyone, for, for attending as well. Um, so, yeah, 
as um, as we'll mention, I work for um, the NBA based in the London office. So our office together with our other office in Madrid oversee the European Middle Eastern uh, region. So to give you guys some background, um, so I'm originally from France. Uh, we have a lot of, you know, Frenchies in the office here because, you know, obviously basketball and the NBA more specifically is very, very famous and popular in France. You know, we've had several legends, uh, a lot of players still in the league right now. So, you know, I've always been, um, yeah, a, li a lifelong fan of the NBA. So my, my journey is I graduated from a business school uh, in Marseille uh, in the South southern part of the country called Kedge Business School. Um, on the back of, I mean, actually, when I was finishing my master's degree, I did a six months internship in a basketball club in France, uh, where I come from in Strasbourg. I then moved uh, to Geneva for a 12 months internship in uh, the International Federation of Automobile back then. Um, so, you know, the, it's kind of the governing body for motorsport so uh, it's I, I always like to we, we always like to call us as you know the the referee for uh, formula one and wrc and formula e and all those those disciplines because the fia doesn't own the commercial rights for these championships but they act as the governing body for all of these championships and actually establish the rules um, so yeah, I did a 12 months internship there, uh, then uh, moved uh, to a uh, part like a contract. So a 10 month contract to stay a bit longer there. I didn't go uh, until the end of the contract because uh, I ended it earlier to, to join the NBA uh, a bit over six years ago. So I moved uh, from Geneva to London. At the time, uh, I took a what we call here a project employee contract, which is basically, you know, a six or seven month contract to cover uh, a maternity leave uh, in my case. So, you know, joined the global partnerships team back then, um, overseeing marketing partnerships in the European Middle East region. So I stayed within that team for a bit over four years. And uh, two years ago, I transitioned into our global media distribution group, uh, where I'm still now uh, working uh, as a part of. And um, so, as I mentioned, our London office oversees Europe and the Middle East. Uh, as far as my role is concerned, right now, I'm the lead media rights commercial person in a few selected European markets. I, um, I'm also the commercial, uh, kind of the lead commercial person on um, the League Pass partnerships that we do across the EME region. Uh, so, you know, targeted at driving uh, subscription growth for us and incremental business value and return on investment for our partners. And finally, I'm, I'm leading all our digital partnerships. So whether that's, you know, licensing of, of short form content, or uh, what we call local destinations, which are basically, you know, uh, the homes of the NBA uh, in certain markets across the region. Um, so yeah, been with the league a bit over six years now, you know, still enjoying it. We have a, a great office here in London and um, yeah, I'm going to pass it on to Flint or, <laughs> or IDJ, how, whoever wants to take it next. Thank you, Steve. Good to, good, uh, good background. I had no idea that you worked in, in the motorsport world as well as the... Yes, uh, I, as I'm the a big Formula One fan as well, so, you know. There's always room. Yeah. Good. Yeah. <laughs> if you uh, you take us on from there over in New York, what's happening over there? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, nice to meet everyone. Um, very pleased to be here. Um, you know, globalization is interesting because... Prior to my stint at Liverpool Football Club in the Americas office, I was actually at the NBA and Global Partnerships in HQ in New York for five years. Um, so globalization is, is something that I've wanted to do as part of my career in sports, but I can give you a quick background, everyone, on where I came from. Graduated undergrad in 2009, worked as a landman, uh, which is an oil and gas uh, leasing agent for a large oil per, uh, petroleum company for over a year, uh, transitioned in, into management consulting, uh, which wasn't a fit for me. I think I'm a natural salesperson. Um, so naturally uh, transitioned and created my own business that was uh, related to sports, which operates on three continents, uh, makes 3D printed mouth guards called Guard Lab, and then have worked at the NBA for five years in global partnerships. Um, I think some of the highlights of that was just interacting with the growth of the league, both globally, domestically, but also the launching of 
other leagues. So I was intimately involved in launching the NBA 2K League, um, which is the first esports league ever operated by a professional sports league. Uh, it is going into its sixth season now, uh, which is a miracle to think about from when it was an idea uh, announced by Adam Silver. And then about a, a little over a year ago, I joined Liverpool Football Club uh, in their New York office, primarily focused on selling partnerships and growing, um, you know, the awareness of the brand from companies headquartered in uh, North and South America. Fantastic. Thank you, Finn. Very interesting. I, fascinating just to hear how, how you've come from outside of the industry into the industry. I think, as I mentioned, we've got 850 or so uh, people tuned into this webinar, um, many of which are students, um, clearly of the GBSG Business School, and, and I know some of them are based in Barcelona and Madrid and, and Malta. And the, the general consensus is that, you know, you go to university and you you get a job in the sports industry and you build yourself up. But I think that's a myth. Um, it does happen clearly, but actually the industry itself now is very much leaning towards people that have functional expertise rather than industry expertise. That functional expertise is the value that you have as an individual, that you can trade wherever, in whatever industry you decide. So you can work in oil and gas as a marketing executive or a sales executive, but you can also work in the sports industry and you can also work in the legal industry if that's, that's your, uh, your desire. So the functional expertise is really important. Uh, and you can take that skill and, and transfer it into the into different interests of industries. Uh, and clearly, Flint, you've done that uh, exceptionally well. Um, Ayodeji, share us a little bit about the world in Lagos and, and, and your journey uh, to get there. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> so my journey was has been quite interesting. Uh, my dad uh, was a medical doctor, he's late now. Uh, so growing up, I wanted to be a medical doctor like him, but I didn't pass the exam to get into medical school. So I got into university to study agriculture with a uh, major in fisheries and wildlife management. So I thought, okay, let me do this for a year or two, then I'll take the exam again to, to get into medical school. So at some point I sort of had an epiphany and I knew I wanted to be a sports administrator. I didn't want to be a medical doctor anymore. I had this epiphany when I actually passed the exam to get into medical school and I had to walk up to my dad to tell him that, sorry, I don't, I don't want to be a medical doctor anymore. He was, he was sort of disappointed. He was, okay, what do you want to do? I said, I want to be a sports administrator. He didn't quite understand it, but he still supported me anyway. So I, I thought of how to get into the industry and the easiest way for me back then was to start as a, as a sports presenter reporter at the, at the local radio and TV station in my hometown. So I did that till I graduated, finished my first degree. Then I traveled to England, uh, a postgraduate diploma in business and his master's in sports management uh, from the London Metropolitan University. So on completion of that degree, I returned uh, back home to Nigeria and I joined a second division club called uh, COD United Football Club as uh, director of football. So I was there for about, about 18 months, then left, then a few months after leaving, I got the job as a marketing and corporate affairs director for, for Sunshine Stars Football Club. Uh, the parent company is called Ondo State Football Agency. So I was there for, for about 20 months. And when La Liga started the internationalization project in 2016, office was, uh, was a, uh, was open in Nigeria. I was hired as one of the pioneer staff, and has been here. I've been here since then. At first, I started out as just a com communications officer, but after a while, I got promoted. So my role involved uh, change to projects and communications. Then a few years down the line, uh, Ghana was added to Nigeria, so the Nigeria office oversees Ghana. So basically, that's what I do right now. I I drive the communication strategy for for La Liga in Nigeria, Ghana, and some other Anglophone countries in Africa. And I also coordinate the project in those countries as well. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, Ayodeje. Um, so 
very interesting perspective from a club point of view, also from uh, a league point of view. Uh, and I, I'm never quite know, quite sure what MBA is because uh, it's, it's a bit of a mixture, but I'd call it a rights holder if, if I'm allowed. So three different backgrounds uh, representing three different uh, organizations or, or sectors of the of the industry i'm going to focus a little bit more now on on international development uh, and what it means for those three different um organizations flint if we, if we go to you straight um clearly liverpool is a, is a truly global brand as as all three brands are um i'm interested in 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 what the sort of strategy is for, for LFC? What, what does internationalization mean? Uh, how's it measured? Um, and what, where are you driving to? What does success look like? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. Um, I think, you know, one thing that we look at is the macro approach of, and you mentioned this earlier, having a billion fans and followers around the world is an incredible thing. And, you know, we're one of a few clubs that can probably say that. When we look at uh, going forward, it's really about the interaction with that fans and the connectivity to those fans and driving experiences for them um, that they won't be able to get because only less than 1% of fans will ever come to Anfield itself. And so how do we look at new technologies, new partners, um, new ways to create connectivity, to create experience, to create um, you know, digital belonging, if you will. And so personally, very excited about the future of fandom and the future of Liverpool Football Club and our ability to connect with fans, whether you're sitting in Chicago or Barcelona or Sao Paulo or Bangkok um, and have this really connected experience to Liverpool Football Club. Uh, in order to do that, you know, we also need to find and work with some of the most innovative companies on the planet and work with companies that want to build and connect and use the passion behind the game of football, behind Liverpool Football Club, behind the anthem of you'll never walk alone and create meaningful experiences for people in their markets, wherever they sit. Um, so our job is a lot about thinking three, four, five years down the road but also thinking right now of what's the great uh, opportunity and where is it? Um, you know, our efforts as a club is we think that in the Premier League and in football in general, the United States is a huge untapped market. It's a fervent sports market. Uh, people love it. Premier League in particular is taking off. And something that, you know, we've seen recently is that Liverpool Football Club has more fans than any U.S. based franchise in the United States. And so how do we interact with them? How do we engage with them? And how do we get brands to come on board to partner and tell those stories, not just in the U.S., but in all these other markets and really be as sophisticated as possible going forward uh, in that connection? Because ultimately, that will drive the next 100 years of success for the football club. Wow. That's amazing. More, more uh, Liverpool, more fans in America than any... American-based franchise, was it? Yeah. You heard it here first. Don't get upset, Steve. It's all right. You've got time. Um, interesting. Let's let's sort of, Iodeji, let's sort of move on to La Liga. Let, let's sort of talk a little bit more around, um, you, you've got a league, you represent the league itself, but clearly underneath that, you've got however many clubs, um, to massive clubs and, and and a host of other very important clubs. Um, what what are the objectives of La Liga in, in the international markets and, and how are you going about sort of delivering those objectives? A bit of backstory on La Liga's internationalization strategy. When the current president, Abi Tebas, became president in 2013, he quickly realized that uh, despite the fact that you just mentioned the big two, uh, La Liga's two of the biggest clubs in world football, two of the biggest sporting brands in world football in uh, Real Madrid and Barcelona, at the time, the two biggest players or two of the biggest athletes in, in the world, Cristiano Ronaldo and Lionel Messi. Despite having these 
sub disadvantages, La Liga was playing second fidel to the EPL, not a close second, a distant second. So it felt like we should be doing more with what we have. So, and like Clint rightly said, there are La Liga fans all over the world, but only a few of them will be able to make it to Spain to watch their team, to watch games. So he decided the next best thing is to take the lead to every part of the world and make, take it closer to the fans. So between then and now, La Liga has opened 11 offices around the world, two of them in Africa, Lagos, Nigeria, and Johannesburg, South Africa. Uh, La Liga has uh, what we call delegates in 45 countries and territories around the world as well. And the job of all these people is to engage with the fans in their, in their, in their locality, engage with the fans, uh, take not just La Liga as a brand, but the clubs of La Liga. La Liga represents 42 clubs, 20 clubs in the primary division and 22, uh, 20 in the primary division and 22 clubs in the second division. So our job is to promote La Liga as a competition and also promote the 42 clubs. And uh, it, one of the strategies that have uh, come out of this is the La Liga in Paul. So uh, La Liga is also encouraging the clubs to not, even though, yeah, they can piggyback on La Liga into these territories, but they should also go to places where they, they have a large following and try and interact and engage with the fans in those countries and territories. Interesting. And, 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 and clearly, La Liga back in 2013 was not an inter, didn't have an international footprint. EFL had, you know, what I remember, but as I say, in those 25 years, it just merged into one year. But the um, they had a footprint. What's that market like now? I mean, how competitive and, and what, what differentiates, I mean, clearly the assets that you have sitting behind the, the league, but what how competitive is it and, and what, what differentiates you when you go to market or head to head with something like the EPL? Well, we, we try to sell ourselves as unique. Uh, we clearly believe that we are the best football league in the world. We have stats to back it up. When I say that, it's not my opinion, it's facts. I mean, if you look at uh, European tournaments uh, in the last 10 years, clearly dominated by La Liga, head to head between La, La Liga clubs and clubs of the top major leagues around Europe, clearly dominated by La Liga as well. So this, this is our selling point. And the brand of football La Liga clubs play, you know, beautiful football, the history, the Spanish culture as well. These are, this is what we sell. And uh, as a follow-up, uh, between 2013 and now, due to this, our internationalization strategy, La Liga has actually closed the gap on the EPL both in terms of uh, figures from TV view, uh, revenue from TV and sponsorship of, and, and all of that, La Liga has closed the gap on EPL. But we are no longer looking at EPL as the competition. Uh, I'm sure if you watch La Liga matches, you see this tagline, it's not football, it's La Liga. Right now, we believe that La Liga is an entertainment brand. It's just not a football competition. It's an entertainment brand. So. When we are looking at competition, we are no longer looking at EPL or Ligue 1 or German Bundesliga or the Dutch DBC. We are looking at the NBA. We are looking at UFC. We are looking at WWE, NHL, cricket, uh, ICC, T20, you know, athletics. Because uh, as a brand of entertainment, we are competing for the same set of eyeballs that all these other brands are competing for. So we have to be at the top of our game. It is why I can sit in Lagos, Nigeria and work for La Liga. It is why Liverpool has an office in New York that Flint works for. It's why the NBA has an office in London and another one in Madrid to cater to these markets. So the competition is, is, uh, is very strong. And if you look at the... Is that the competition is strong, and if you are not at the top of the of your game, you get left behind. It is that simple. Simple is good. Simple is good. Um, Steve, over to you. Um, clearly, the uh, French league. I don't know where where they're sitting in the uh, internationalisation of football, but let's uh, let's stay stay with the NBA. 
MBA has been around since, nine, well, as we said earlier, 1978 was where the first international sort of sign or flag was raised in, in Israel, of, of all places. Um, can you share a little bit more around your international development strategy? Um, yeah, what, what that looks like? What, what, what are you trying to achieve? Yeah, and, and just to... to to uh, you know to to respond to what IODJ was saying i think you know we in terms of the competition i think you know also going beyond sport uh you know i think now the biggest competitors are just in the entertainment space in general right because you have you know so many options uh for content for merch for everything so that you know obviously La Liga can compete with Premier League and Serie A and whoever you want, but then beyond sport, you also have so many other properties that are now relevant to the younger generation. So I think, you know, we're just all fighting for the same things. But yeah, to to um to answer to your to your question, uh, well, I think I would I would uh, actually, you know, divide our strategy in uh, in three different uh, pillars. Uh, and I'm just going to go up the funnel. So I, I would say, obviously, the basis of our international strategy is um, our players. You know, I think that we are lucky to have uh, some of the most influential uh, athletes in the world. Uh, you know, you can think of, you know, obviously LeBron James, but uh, all all the others, you know, Steph Curry, Kevin Durant. Uh, we have Yanis now coming from Europe as well. Nikola Djokic, like all of these guys, you know, are are so influential not only domestically but also globally because more and more you know the the num the number of international play of, in of international players within the league has increased so you know i would say that's part of the of the globalization and the international strategy development of our league is to lean on those players uh you know to kind of help spread the message that our league is international and help us develop uh it as much as possible so i would say that's you know pillar number 1 pillar number 2 are the 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 teams and and will I think you can call us a league because technically you know we we are we are rights holder we are also a league and I would say yeah pillar number two is 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 the teams in the sense that up until a few years ago you know the teams were only able to market um, uh, 150 kilometers around uh, the arena from a from a pure marketing perspective and in the past few we past few years we've opened up. Uh, you know, some of their rights to market internationally, uh, a bit similar to what the NFL have done, but we've done it in a different way in the sense that we've allowed our teams to work on marketing partner on global marketing partnerships. So with brands globally on activations around the world. So whereas in the past, for example, I don't know, the Lakers or the Bulls were not allowed to sign a partnership in China or were not allowed to sign a partnership in India. Now they have, as part of that program, the ability to sign those partnerships. And that's also, you know, part of the international development strategy that, that we are adopting. And just, I mean, it's tied to the teams and to the league, but obviously, you know, what you've mentioned in terms of global games, uh, that's also, you know, a big part of our strategy. So I was in Paris two weeks ago because we had the Bulls facing the Pistons. Uh, you know, we had two games in Abu Dhabi in October. We had games in Japan uh, before COVID. We had games in India. We've had games in China. Like we're just, we have Mexico as well. We're, we have, we had NBA Africa game as well. We've just been hosting games globally uh, for yeah over 40 years now. And that's, you know, at, at, at the team level, that's, yeah, as, as, as I mentioned, part of our international development strategy. Now, if I look at the league level, um, Again, I think I would be able to to divide that in in three sub pillars. So obviously, pillar number one is everything that is linked to basketball. So um, you know, talking about, I talked about our top athletes. So you know, I, I consider them like you know, obviously top of the pyramid. But the idea of the league is to try to grow that you know grassroots basketball development pyramid around the world. So it starts with, uh, you know, what we call junior NBA, which is our uh, base level global development program. So, you know, we run programs around the world, uh, you know, in Europe, in the Middle East, in Africa, in Asia, in Latam, like just everywhere, you know, we have uh, our basketball operations team working with the local federations on uh, just, you know, 
uh, very, very basic, uh, you know, basketball development programs to help grow the game of basketball, because ultimately the goal of the league is to grow the game of basketball in order to, you know, nurture more fans in the future. So going up the pyramid, we have, you know, now other programs uh, called, you know, NBA Basketball School, which are curriculum we partner on with uh, same federations or private entities to deliver in certain countries. And then, you know, as I continue to grow, we have, uh, we've had a historic and very successful uh, Basketball Without Borders um, initiative uh, in, jo in a joint venture with FIBA. We were basically, you know, the top talents of the world are invited. And now we see more and more of these guys actually ending up, ending up playing in the league, uh, which obviously, you know, is, is very rewarding for us. We have obviously, we've created four academies around the world. Um, and, you know, it continues to grow. We have an academy in Africa, one in Australia, one in Latam as well. So, you know, we just try to continue um, this one forward. And then just, you know, just before the NBA, but we also have, you know, as, as Flint mentioned, because he launched uh, the 2K League uh, when he was at the NBA, but we have our affiliate leagues. Um, and obviously 2K League, I think is, you know, the, the one league that, has international teams within the league at the moment, which isn't the case for the others. But there are also another one, uh, which IODJ, I'm sure, is very familiar with. Uh, it's our Basketball Africa League, uh, also launched in joint venture with FIBA, um, where basically, you know, we're trying to help uh, develop and grow the, the professional basketball in Africa. So our third season is going to start in a few weeks. And, you know, we are very excited and with the with this initiative because we see we see a lot of growth um in africa so yeah i would say that's you know kind of the grassroots basketball sub pillar sub pillar number two i would say is around everything we do on content so obviously you know we have broadcast partnerships around the world uh in europe uh in the middle east all the countries are covered except malta don't ask me why but malta is the only country where you know we don't have a broadcast partner but yeah we have teams around the world so as you mentioned 16 offices uh people you know locking those partnerships in to get the game on tv to get the game on digital to game to get to get the game on social media as well depending on you know the the, the approaches that we take on a country by country basis uh we also have uh our our nba app which we launched um you know four months ago a new app that we launched in september um which is our own and operated uh product and also you know helps us touching the fans uh at, at via different uh touch points so you know and different times as time zones as well because obviously when you're in in europe you know most of the games will be uh played in the middle of the night so it's how you get to those fans in the morning when they wake up you know having some uh formats created for them that are relevant not too long that you can you know kind of consume before you you go to work or as you're going to work so this is kind of also you know part of our our international strategy and then i would say that the third sub pillar that i would like to highlight today is everything we do around our uh product so we call it licensing or you know however you want but it goes from nba 2k which is you know a massive success globally and you know such a big touch point for us with fans around the world we have uh, we've opened stores, NBA stores, a bit everywhere in the world now as well. Obviously, we work hand in hand with our um, biggest global licensees, such as you know Nike or New Era, to get the product out there as well. Uh, you know, jerseys, hats, hoodies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yeah, I would say those are you know three of the of the biggest. Uh, sub pillars uh, that the league is focused on um, and you know those strategies are you know kind of um, uh, deployed by the regional offices that we have so two in Europe we have four now in Africa we want with everywhere around the world thank you Steve. let me just take you back on something that Steve said um, we're fortunate enough that LeBron James is one of our owners in Fenway Sports Group yeah. at Liverpool Football Club and he just launched last week uh, a collaboration with with Nike, who's our kit supplier, Liverpool, uh, of a LeBron James kit and an, and an Air Force One, uh, which is growing relevance, not just in the States, in the UK, but globally as well. So um, all of this is tapping into culturally relevant moments and 
taking personalities and merchandise and building something that is around the culture of sport and, and how you drive interest through culture. Um, and so we're fortunate that's part of it, but tapping into both football and basketball on this panel is pretty interesting. Thanks, Flint. And thank you, Steve. Doesn't It sounds like we're not going to be able to get away from the NBA soon. No. Even if we, even if we try. No, no, no. I don't think you will. It's everywhere, ubiquitous. Um, just, a, just a note before we, we go forward is um, uh, questions. We're going to try and take questions at the end so we get some fluidity around the, the topics that we're discussing. But if you've got any questions, uh, fire them through on the Q&A on... on uh, uh, on the Zoom platform, uh, there there have been some good questions already. I'm saving them to towards the end. We've probably got five, six, seven, eight minutes left of, of discussions, and then we'll we'll move on to to the Q and A. So don't hold back on the questions, um, and we'll get those answered as and when we can. Um, I think the, the one thing I, I was going to say, and um, Flint, you brought this up. Well, you triggered my mind just then when you talked about um, Liverpool and, and, and basketball, really. How is the American market adapting to the internationalization of sports coming into America rather than the American sports, you know, NBA going out of America? Because America is such a massive nation in itself that historically I, I viewed it sort of as, as four key sports and, and they're their sports and they sort of are relatively intra, internal and introverted. Whereas, you know, we're starting to see football, well, I say starting, we, we're seeing football growing quite significantly there, but I know cricket has had some false dawns in America, et cetera, et cetera. How, how, how you know, sitting in New York, how do you see, that access point or America is an access point for international sports coming towards America. It's a, you know, I think the tidal wave is, is hitting the States. Um, and, and, you know, I think part of it is the prominence of the premier league and the history there. I think La Liga was having a moment as well. Uh, but, you know, you could see it in the broadcast rights. NBC renewed for the premier league at a significant increase last year. Um, Saturday mornings in New York city, Pubs and bars across the city are, are have different, you know, official supporters clubs. I wear a Liverpool kit, you know, pretty much anywhere in New York City. I'll get a you never walk alone or walk on um, or, you know, you know, Mo Salah or, or things of that nature. Um, and then as it's spreading across, you know, unlike the night times and overnight games for the NBA going across the pond to Europe, you're waking up on Saturday mornings and it's Premier League morning. Um, and people are tuning in or Sunday mornings. And then likewise, when we play in Europe and in the Champions League on Tuesdays and Wednesday nights or in the FA Cup, you know, they're at three o'clock. So people are headed to the pub or the bar, uh, you know, to the local supporter and they're all tuning in. Um, when I started in sports about six years ago, the thought of football encroaching on U.S. sports was non-existent. Yeah. Now... Before I started, and part of the reason I went to join Liverpool Football Club is I saw the tidal wave was coming, um, and football is truly becoming one of America's sports, um, which is really interesting. And people are embracing it, and they're loving it, and the passion. And I think a lot of that has to go with the globalization of the world. People are traveling all over the world. They experience the passion behind football when they are on vacation. They're becoming a, a you know a lifelong fan of of whatever club it is hopefully it's Liverpool Football Club but it's not always the case because a cousin studied abroad and lived in Leeds or you know was in you know Marseille and went to the the velodrome and saw OM beat PSG or things of that nature and they're trying to find and tune into football um and you've, so and you've I think cup coming in 26 yeah World Cup coming in 26 uh this past World Cup was big I, I feel like the United States always tuned into World Cup. I think club football is really going to be taking over the next 10, 15 years in the United States, just how, how exciting it is and the big name stars. You know, we are hosting Real Madrid in the Champions League on Tuesday, February 21st. It's a rematch of the Champions League final, which we lost by 1-0. One, one, one 
it will be a mega event around the world. I think it'll be a mega event in the United States. Yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible. That speed, that six years that you were talking about where it's nothing and then it's all of a sudden it's ubiquitous. Um, yeah. Iodeji, you said something yesterday to me um, that I still haven't forgotten, uh, which was around Arsenal fans in your um, in Nigeria. Just share, share that little anecdote very quickly with people, just again, just to give some some real, well, some some fact really to um, to how international. Uh, when we talk about football and we've talked about NBA, you know, it's not just those those sports, but it but they are some of the bigger ones, and therefore the the impact is greater. Yeah, I mean, like Flint rightly said, all of this is happening because of the effects of uh, globalization. Uh, I'm from I'm from Nigeria. I live in Lagos. The population of Lagos is about twenty million people. Population of Nigeria now is slightly over 200 million people. And I can tell you for a fact that there are more Arsenal fans in Nigeria than in the United Kingdom. It's crazy. It, it I is. love that. It's crazy. It is. It is. Well, yeah. Nigeria, Nigeria is the second biggest TV market for Liverpool Football Club after the United Kingdom. I, really? I, I don't doubt that. I, I do not doubt that, you know. And I, I also want to add to what Flynn said earlier about the tidal wave of uh, football as a sport creeping into America. Uh, La Liga has an office in America, in New York. And uh, we saw this wave coming a few years back. And uh, as part of our globalization uh, efforts, you know, uh, the NBA talked about having games abroad, regular season games abroad, spanning like 40 years now. In 2018, La Liga attempted to play a league game now, a proper league game in, in Miami between Barcelona and Villarreal. La Liga was able to convince both clubs to have that game there. You know, uh, Miami is somewhere, somewhere that in America that has a huge uh, Latin American population, I believe. So it was the perfect game to take to that, to the, to that city. But at the time, the, the Spanish Federation didn't quite agree to it. Uh, that plan is in the cooler, and I believe in the nearest future we'll start seeing La Liga regular season La Liga games abroad. I mean, take for instance, uh, a few weeks back we saw the Spanish Super Cup played in Saudi Arabia. We we are seeing leagues take Super Cup their Super Cup games abroad. It's only a function of time before you see a regular season game abroad. The the purists won't like it, you know, but it is what it is, really. It is what it is. The world is now a global village. So in as much as the Liverpool fans in Merseyside wants to watch Liverpool every week at Anfield, the Liverpool fans in New York also wants to see Liverpool play in New York. The Liverpool fans in, in Singapore, in India, in South Africa, in Nigeria, they also want to see their beloved Liverpool play in their city. So it's only a function of time. I mean, we saw Euro 2020. We've, we, we're gradually moving into a new era. In the past, it used to be one country hosting a tournament. Euro 2020 was basically spread across Europe. Yeah. And it was fun. So I see I, it, this is going to be the norm moving forward. It's going to be the norm. And you quickly. Don't need to do it first. And it's quickly. Going to be the norm. the, the yeah. speed. The speed is going to take us all by surprise, I think. 2026 um, World Cup, you are having three three countries host, USA, Canada, Mexico. Yeah. yeah. I think for 2030 World Cup, there is a joint bid. Uh, there is a Portugal, Spain, Ukraine joint bid. Yeah. You know, moving forward, we are going to see more of these yeah. collaborations. Games but, abroad is going to become the norm. Euro 2020 was, what, eight, nine, ten cities? Twelve cities? Yeah. I can't remember. yeah. Anyway, look, um, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for that insight. Uh, I'm conscious of time, uh, and I'm also sort of conscious that you know our audience are a young audience, uh, or the majority of them are young audience, and, and they're looking to um, start or even develop their career from where they start at the where they are at the moment. Um, I'm going to go back to um, IODG just in terms of for, for for La Liga itself, just one or two lines on. What what the future holds for you guys? What, yeah, what what does what do you want out of the future? And what and what opportunities do you see for for the young generation coming through 
in terms of jobs, what you know, and where they where they are likely to be. So it could be functional skills, it could be geographical, um, or, or or it could be something else. Well, get yourself into an industry one way or the other. I got in by starting out as a, as a journalist, then went, then got an the job. Uh, uh, Steve said something about interning with two different sports organization, then getting into MB as a temp temporary, then a role opened up, then it got it, then it got that role. So with leagues and sporting brands expanding around the world, obviously they will need more people on board. When Avi Tebas became president of La Liga in 2013, La Liga only had less than 50 staff, 50 members of staff. Uh, the major office in Madrid and a smaller office in Barcelona. Right now, La Liga has close to 600 members of staff scattered around the world. So up, as, as the sports industry continues to get bigger, opportunities will come. So position yourself, volunteer somewhere, intern somewhere, opportunities will come your way, be ready. And when they come, just grab it. Sounds good. Um, Steve, from your perspective, you know, what does the future hold for the NBA? And, and, and again, where do you see opportunities for, for the audience that we're talking to today? Um, I think I, I, will, I will echo, uh, you know, most of what IUD just said in terms of, you know, obviously we, we, are, we are recruiting, uh, you know, a ton at the moment. Like uh, if you go on our job board, like there are, there are lots of, of open roles and I think it will continue. You know, we have a very ambitious growth plan in Africa. So I'm, I'm sure, you know, we'll continue to recruit there. Uh, you know, obviously Europe is a more mature market, but we're, we're still growing our, our you know, uh, I would say employee base. Lat time we're growing, you know, like we're growing a bit everywhere in the world. And I think I, I would say the advice I always uh, like to, to give and, you know, Flint can, uh, I'm sure, relate to that is that obviously, you know, starting in the sports industry and growing in the sports industry is, is one journey, but you can also start outside the sport industry and then join the sport industry if you've acquired an expertise that then becomes relevant uh, in the sports industry. And I think, you know, the one example that I can think of right now, top of my head is, you know, for example, a big strategic pillar of the NBA's our direct to consumer uh, offering product. Uh, so obviously you have NBA League Pass, but we've launched an, a membership program called NBA ID as well. And I guess, you know, everyone who comes with, you know, either membership slash loyalty experience in any industry really, or anyone who's worked on a very, you know, direct to consumer or business to consumer uh, business or industry before, automatically becomes super relevant uh, to us, you know, just because those persons will have acquired knowledge and skills that, in my opinion, can be transferred to sports very, not very easily, but they can be transferred to sport. And, you know, I think it's good, you know, to force people who've been in the sports industry since the start of their career to think a bit outside the box. So, uh, yeah, that's that's what I would um, what I would you know that's that would be my advice. I think you know obviously, again, going through sports is fine, but you, there are other avenues uh, that can make you as much relevant, if not even more relevant, for certain positions if you're not coming from inside the sports industry. Thank you, Steve. Um, Flint, you, you may have. Uh something to say on that and, and feel free to do so but i'm going to throw a question at you and you can answer it um as you see fit but in your world uh, i think you left left university in 09 so, so 12 years roughly or 13 years um what's Don't age me. <laughs> yeah it just rolls into one what has been the biggest challenge in your career so far and that's a that's a question from uh, from the from the audience it's a really good question the biggest challenge in my career so far was when i went into the nba um you know i kind of, kind of took a step down from where i was in career i was a founder of a company you know we had some success and i went into a more junior role and i wasn't sure if it was right for me and so i actually went back to business school to get my mba from columbia while I was at the nba and what I realized quickly was 
the focus for me was find something I was truly passionate about, which was working in sport. I love sport. I watch documentaries about every sport you can think of. I love the idea of connecting brands to sport. I love the idea. I read books. You know, I've probably read 14 books on the New Zealand All Blacks. I've never played rugby a day in my life. Uh, so I, I realized that's where my passion was. And the idea that sport is a truly global language and it's something that people have passion for and love. Um, so my challenge for me was, do I take my degree and leave something I love for something that might be in the short term more lucrative? Or do I follow, you know, the passion that I have and, you know, the skills that I developed? And I had one professor at Columbia tell me, you know, there's always going to be a better accountant. There's always going to be a better lawyer. But what are you best at in the world? Um, and I think about the Liverpool Football Club, you know. There might be someone who might be better defending than Trent Alexander-Arnold, but there's no one at better at delivering balls into the box than Trent Alexander-Arnold. So do that. Uh, be passionate about what you are. And, um, you know, I think you'll you'll end up in a great spot. And if you love sport and you want to work there, there's thousands of pathways to get there. Good, good answer, Finn. Thank you. Um, putting this out again, we're now sort of quite deep into the, uh, the Q&As that are, that are coming through. Do you see a master's in sports management as an advantage to join the sports industry? Um, I, I'm going to leave. Um, there's a, it goes on, but I'll, I'll stop there. Steve, what, what's your view on that? Have you done a, are you a master's student? You, you are, aren't you? I've, I've done a, a... So I went to Marseille to do a master in sports management, but I ended up not doing it because my internship, the company I was... At, so the FIA wanted me for 12 months. And that would have basically hit the first half of my master in sports. So I ended up, you know, uh, prioritizing the, the professional experience over the my education. But yeah, I, I originally that's why I went to Marseille, uh, because I wanted to do a master's uh, in, in sport. I would say, and again, so I, I cannot say if from a pure educational perspective, it's, uh, you know, helpful to do a, a master in sport. Although I do believe that obviously, you know, you're being exposed to to professional that work in the industry, know, know the industry. So I'm sure, you know, they're able to teach a lot of things. I would say the, the thing I've noticed, obviously, and it's very uh, pregnant in the sport industry, I think, is, is the importance of the network. Uh, you know, wh whatever you do, you know, wherever you want to try to go, uh, network is very important. And that's where I think, you know, a master in sport management can be super helpful for young graduates because automatically, you know, you access to, yeah, I mean, you have access, first of all, to the people that obviously you're in school with and that, you know, 10 or 15 years down the line might help you out on an opportunity or, you know, to get a job or to get something else. But also you get access to the, you know, historical graduates that, you know, have done the same masters. Because I think, you know, when I receive an invite from someone from my school, you know, I'm always a bit more like, oh, yeah, you know, interesting. We've kind of had the same path. So I think, you know, that that network angle is is very important. Interesting. Yeah, I'll add to that. When we hire, you know, probably get hundreds of applicants or thousands, even when I was at the NBA. And so it just shows an intent to want to work in sport more than, hey, this is an interesting thing. I like watching LeBron play on, you know, Wednesday nights, you know, and so. That's that's kind of the first driver. And then, as Steve said, the network's super important. Um, network in sports is key because ultimately it's a people business and it's about making relationships and building trust. And then from there, driving, you know, results um, all over. And so uh, I think it's a great and, thing. And if you had to interview some, if you had two CVs in front of you now, uh, one had done a, a master's in, in sport and someone had done a master's, an MBA in business administration so non-sport both you know good universities um you know um which would you favor without clearly meeting them which would go in the yes one had to go in the yes pile and one had to go in the no pile which one would it be so trick question for me because i did an mba for not sports related but i was working at the mba so i i okay. for me i felt i was getting my phd in business uh but Depending on the role, it'd probably be the master in sports business because I would think the dedication, the focus was there. The MBA side, you know, depending on if it was a more business focused role with a little bit more hard skills needed, 
um, then that that might be the choice. But it, that's a that's a really tough toss up. Fine line. I, I have AG, you, you did a masters in London, I think you said. Yeah, London, uh, but, it's but it, and it was sport, wasn't it? Sports management, yes. What, what what's your sort of thoughts on that? Is is masters important? Did yeah, it need I, you? I, I think it's important. I mean, my own first degree was in agriculture. So I'm never going to go knocking people's door and say, yo, I have a bachelor's degree in fisheries and wildlife management. Mm -hmm. I have experience in managing national parks. Can you make me the director of football of your, of your football club? No. So I thought even though I had passion for sports, I needed something else to back me up, something that makes, that gives my CV that edge in the midst of hundreds of thousands of CV. So I had to take a, a master's degree in sports. I'm actually studying for a PhD in sports management at the moment as well. So in sports, I, what? Sorry, like, what? what so, uh, you're studying for a PhD in in sports management? Yes. Okay. Where? So I, uh, Concordia University. Well, okay. Well done. So I, I believe it gives you an edge. It gives you an edge. I mean, like uh, Flint Riley said, it comes down to sports itself as an industry. It's, it's decided by very minute details, very minute details. So it comes down to you and clear up with MBAs and they go like, okay, it's a sporting role. Let's call the guy who has a, mas who has a master's in sports, sports administration. And also like Steve said, the network, your classmates 10, 10 years down the line, they are at certain places. Sports is a people business. You know, forget your PowerPoint presentation and your your ability to speak multiple languages. If you have a good relationship with the CEO of that company or the MD of that company or the GM of that club is your old school mate or an alumni of your school, it makes, it makes talking and doing business much more easier. You can't say fairer than that. Um, so last question before, before we wrap up and, and this is, uh, I'm gonna go around, around the group here. Um, one piece of advice that you, if you knew when you uh, left your university or your postgraduate course, um, that you, if you knew then what you don't know now type thing, what, what would that be? And how, you know, sh share it to the, uh, to the group. What, uh, uh, Steve, I'll, I'll let you, you go first. What one piece of advice would, for any budding sports industry professional, um, what would you what would it be? Be kind to everyone because as Flint mentioned, it's a people's industry and also, you know, leagues and clubs are growing internationally. I think everyone knows everyone. Um, so, you know, it's still quite a small industry if you compare it to FMCG or any other industry. So I'd say, yeah, to like just, you know, make sure that you nurture those relationships uh, as, as much as possible because they will be beneficial down the line. Fair enough. I, Deji, what, what, what's your one piece of advice? If you really want to do this, then follow through. It's going to be tough at the start. It's going to really retell because there are not too many jobs, too many people competing for the same jobs. But once you get into the industry, double down, work hard, follow through on your passion, and the the end justifies the means. Very good. Um, Flynn, follow that one. Mine's a little bit of a combination of both. So your first job is not going to be your last job in sports, but your first job could be your last job if you don't embrace it. So you're often not going to get the most senior title and do the most glamorous stuff right away. But if you do all the little things right that make you a great team player and you grow up, you'll be doing those things quicker and people will love you for it. And you'll have this immense amount of skill and, and passion and, and leaders that can help you find your next role. So it's doing the little things right. It's the same thing as being an athlete. You got to work hard, you know, in practice. You got to be a good teammate, all of those types of things. It really matters and it, and it really shines through. Bring a good attitude and a smile and be nice. Wow. Uh, I thought I had some ideas of what I would, was going to say, but you three have uh, completely undone me. Uh, very good advice from all, all three of you. So thank you very much. Um, 
that actually brings us nicely to the end. There are other questions and answers, and I'm sorry that we haven't been able to get through uh, all of them. Uh, it's just, unfortunately, we only have the hour. They, these three are very important people and their time is precious. Um, but what I would like to say on behalf of Global Sports and the audience here, that you three have been fantastic. You've been very insightful. You have shared honestly and openly everything that you, you can do and all that's been asked of you. So thank you very much indeed. We wish you all the very best in the future. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, thank you very much again. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Everyone. Take care. Bye.